The program you're about to watch is one of a range of practical gardening videos produced by Periwinkle Productions. You'll find details about the others and how to contact us at the end of this tape. Throughout, our aim is for you to watch The Expert and then experience the sheer pleasure of being able to go out into your own garden or greenhouse and do it yourself. From now on, you'll share with others that extra special confidence which these programs provide to create a garden of which you can be truly proud. So, sit back and enjoy yourself. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Maybe so, but it wouldn't be a rose. And it's roses on which we're going to concentrate for the next 90 minutes or so. It's a fascinating story with its roots back in the distant past. and most rewarding shrubs to grow. I'm at the home of the Royal National Rose Society at St Albans. Later we'll be meeting Ken Grapes, the Secretary General of the Society. But first I'm off to find Steve Bradley, our expert horticulturalist, to have a look around these lovely gardens. Lovely colours here. Puts me in mind of old masquerade, this does. Yeah, what I like about it is the way the colour changes. You start off with almost a yellow, yeah. and then it goes to deeper and deeper, this really dark red, almost yeah. a burnt red before yeah. it finishes. Like uh, this times here. Wonderful colour. Look at the purple shoots on it. It looks so healthy, mm. don't they? That deep purple. It almost matches the flower colour in some yes. respects. I think the bark must help, you know. Keeps the damp in, doesn't it? Stops watering, yeah, so often. The an iceberg here. Yeah, look at that, though. It's so different. The pale yes. foliage, the yes. white flowers. Terrific. And now for the shade, Harry. Yes. Wonderful feature this makes, isn't it? Yeah, just look at it. Yeah. It's just amazing. So many different colours. That's it. All in flower all at once. And the uh, repeat bloomers most of the year. That's right. I suppose most of them originate from between the First and Second World War onwards. Mm. And uh, as the modern climbers, or the repeat flowering climbers as we now know them, came into being. And whereas the ramblers, you tend to get... Um, ah one big flush of flowers that's and that's it. it with these you don't get the massive display yes. but the thing is that you've always got some flowers on really until the frosts mm. yeah, some of these ramblers you just finish up with a great big sweeping up of the petals <laughs> that's right and that's it you must know a lot about varieties to be able to make sure you get the different ones so that you don't get two colors together or a, a really vivid contrast yes. although the colors are pretty good they mix them pretty well don't they? yeah I wonder if they mix them for scent as well, you know, so they've ah, got a very mm. heavily scented one and then a not so heavily scented one. What's interesting about these though, I mean, the way they're trained along the ropes. Ah, yes. And you can see here, look, you've actually got a continuous line of branches running now. They've actually trained the branches, tied them to the ropes, 
then you get all these lateral shoots developing that have got flowers on them. Yeah, it's a good example of that, isn't it? Yeah, because what happens is you actually get a shoot developed from each bud all the way along the stem rather than yeah. just something in the top. And there's the result. And lovely flowers these, Zephyr and mm. That's right. It's supposed to be thornless, but I can see one or two there. Yeah, there are one or two on it, but it's the nearest thing we've got to a thornless yeah. rose, you know. That's incredible. Very good. Look at this white, and it's so pure, mm. isn't it? Marvellous. During the course of this programme, you may well hear some horticultural terms with which you're not familiar. For example, what is a bud union? But when you buy a rose, you actually get two roses that are joined together. First of all, here you've got a variety, which is grown for its ornamental characteristics. Now this is actually grown on a seedling rootstock or briar, which is grown for its vigour. At the rose nursery, they're using budding to raise thousands of a variety to supply the garden centres. Budding involves carefully making a tea cut into the bark of the collar or neck of the briar rootstock. A single bud is then removed from the young stem of a variety that's required and inserted under the flaps that have been cut into the bark of the rootstock. The bud is held in position with a budding patch or tie. And all this is is a biodegradable rubber patch with a staple through it which will rot off through the winter. Some skilled budders can bud up to 5,000 roses a day. How's that for back eight? What they were actually doing out there in the field was removing a single bud from the chosen variety. Now that is all you need to provide you with a new variety. Just one bud from a new stem. After it's been inserted into the rootstock, during the winter, the top of the rootstock is removed just above the inserted bud. Within about 14 months, what you have is this. Still see the rootstock from the seedling briar. This top growth that you can see here now is actually the variety, so it's replaced the top growth of the rootstock. And the cut that was made, you can see here, this blackish brown disc is the dead wood from where the top of the rootstock was physically cut off during the winter. And this point here, this swelling, this is the budding union where the two separate plants are joined together. You'll often hear people ask about sports. This last summer here in the garden we found something that illustrates this point perfectly. A sport is a natural variation that occurs, often called a mutation. You get a single shoot developed from the plant which for some reason has a different coloured flower to it. As you can see, here there's a bed of peas. They're all yellow, with the exception of this one. One of the plants has thrown up this shoot. It's got a different coloured flower to it. If this flower's taken off and propagated, you can actually introduce it as a variety in its own right. Peace has got a tendency to do this, and there are several sports of peace available. A plant could also throw up a shoot which has a different growth habit. For example, climbing iceberg was propagated from a sport which developed from the iceberg bush variety. Occasionally, these sports may revert. That's where they change back to the same colour and habit of the parent plant. You can see this happening with the striped flowers of Rosa Mundi, which is reverting back to the plain red of its parent plant. Roses are born survivors. Plant them properly in the first place and they seldom fail. Ken and Brad have some tips about planting roses and also, the thing we find most difficult, how to train them so they flower all over, not just at the top and into next door's garden. There's an awful lot of debate about when's the best time of year to plant roses. Do you have any hard and fast views on this, Ken? We think, Brad, that far and away the best time is in the autumn and in the spring using bare root plants. They establish better and quicker and they get away and make a lovely plant in the end. The most important thing in planting, Brad, we think, 
is don't buy rubbish. Look for a really stout plant with a lovely bushy root system with at least two or three good strong stems coming off the budding union. This is quite a good specimen. It may need a little trimming up and it's best to do that before uh, you plant it. Just trim off any little dead snags, like so. Look at, look at the roots. If there is a long, ungainly root, it can be shortened back. That one perhaps is perhaps a little bit long. If you would just hold that yeah, for sure. me and we'd snip him off so. Anything else? Nope. We can go straight then on to planting him. Right, so the best way to reward a good quality plant and give it a head start is put in some manure. Because it's a climber going against the wall, we've left a space of about a foot or 18 inches so that it's not being planted in a dry situation. A bit of soil over the top of the manure so you don't burn the roots. Place it nicely away from the wall. It needs to be at least a foot and with the roots facing away from the wall yet. You ready? OK, off you go. Break the soil up quite nicely and gently shake the plant so that it settles and firms in. What we're looking for is to have the budding union, which we've talked of already, just below ground level on planting. And here we are, just like that now, a bit more soil around it. And shake him down, settle him in. Reasonably I, nice soil. Shall I do the honours with the boot? Yes, please. That's firmed the soil very nicely at round bread. A little more to fill in the, uh, the holes. And a gentle water to get the soil nicely around those roots that we just put in there. That should do the trick. It stops any airlocks developing. Yes, it does. Now, the, this is a climbing rose, and the next important thing is to train it on something. People make a lot of fuss about uh, pruning and training and looking after climbing roses. Training, I think, is perhaps the most important bit. You need a good framework, a good support, a permanent support. Here we've got a galvanised wire held onto the wall with vine eyes or similar. And we're going to train this piece back here uh, with a, a, a bit of string. I see you've got some conveniently cut to length. Yes, I always find it's easier rather than fumbling around in my pockets of the ball of string to actually have some bits cut ready. Just a simple, straightforward uh, knot around it, fixed on, trim off the ends to be tidy, and there's the first one done. Very important now to train the other ones the way we want them to grow. If we're going to get this rose to flower really well for us, we want it to flower all along the length of every stem so that it covers the whole of the ball with a beautiful mass of flower. So we'll train this one to the right. My right, that is. And there then I'll do the honours, shall I? Yes. There we go. And this one likewise, and the result of this years to come as new shoots are made and we will train them accordingly. I think we'll fetch up with a very beautiful plant here. It's fine. How long do you think it'll last here? 20 years. So what's happening here then, Ken? I've never seen climbers train quite like this before. The problem with climbers, Brad, is that most people let them grow straight up and all you get at the top is a great bird's nest of foliage and flowers with lots of bare, ugly stems at the bottom. And that's very poor. The aim of this uh, structure here is to enable us to spiral the rows as each stem grows around and around. You can see it's got lots of places to tie into and the great advantage of this is that you achieve the same results as we've just done by training horizontally on a wall. This uh, spiral training will cause each of these buds, here's one, here's another, here you can see they're already breaking out, here's one well out. These buds will each produce a lovely flowering shoot and the result will be a beautiful pillar of flower as opposed to ugly bare stems. And the same applies whether you are in fact training them on a pillar or the side of an arch. Is there any special pruning that needs to be done with these? Pruning climbing roses is dead easy. People think it's jolly difficult, but actually it isn't. There are really two simple things you have to remember. Firstly, where there is a, a leading shoot, and here's a lovely leading shoot, and this shoot terminates in a flowering bud. That wants to come off, so we would just nicely prune here above a bud, snip, off it goes, and that's all that needs to be done for the end of the leading shoot. They are not pruned at all otherwise. 
The only other pruning you do are all the side shoots. Now here are some on this uh, uh, approaching you, and all that's done is to snip them all off just above a, 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 a bud, perhaps two, three inches long. So you're just leaving a spur. So just leaving a short spur. All of the dormant buds in these short spurs will produce flowering shoots. So and that's all there is to it. And you're getting clusters of blooms then. Beautiful flowers. Well, the only thing with this, the only thing that's wrong with it, as far as I'm concerned, for my garden, it's just too big. I haven't got the room. I accept that that does take up quite a lot of space. This is quite a strong growing rose. But I've got a good idea to show you, which I think would be suitable for your oh, garden. Gary, I'm all for new ideas. Here's a stout wooden post, about six foot tall, firmly set, as you see, in the ground. And to it, we've taken some clematis netting. This plastic net's commonly available in just about any garden centre. Form it into a tube, and it's stapled on to the post, so it makes a long tube. The rose is then planted at the bottom, and you can then spiral it around, just as we've already described. So I could get away with growing quite a vigorous variety around here, because you could, I'm winding it around and around. This could take a lot of growth. With standards, the important thing is to make sure that you've got a good stout stake for support and a tie that's got some sort of spacer there. That's really important because it stops the stem bashing against the support and make sure the top of the support is just below the lowest bud. Although that works very well and they are quite common, there are other much simpler methods, aren't there, Ken? Just like a good piece of stout twine fixed to the bottom of the stem and the stake Nicely knotted, round we go, a tidy knot on the bottom of the stem, not too tight because the stem must have some room to grow. And there we are, nice neat job. That's not going to go far is it? No, that'll last. If your roses arrive and it's inconvenient to plant them, either because you're too busy or if the weather's not too good, the thing to do as a temporary measure, make sure the roses don't spoil, is to do what's called healing in. Dig a hole, add a spade wide and a spade deep, place the rose in it, make sure that the roots are well covered with soil, and then firm in with your boot, that's why it's called healing in, and they'll stay there for up to a couple of months if need be, until the weather's suitable or you get time to plant them in the permanent position. An interesting way of growing climbers is on a catenary. Start off with some good, strong, sturdy posts, some good thick rope that'll take the weight, run the rope through eyes so that they're not rough and wear the rope, and this will take the weight of your roses. Finally, finish off by firmly fixing the ends by knocking in a strong nail with a good flat head which will trap the rope. Make sure that you support the post, otherwise it'll flap about until it's set in position. During the summer there are one or two jobs to be done to get the best from your roses. Deadheading is one of them. This means cutting off the old flowers to encourage more to develop. 
both with climbers and bush roses, I've always cut back to the third leaf joint. But with many varieties, especially the species, you'll have a fine display of hips in the autumn if you leave them. In recent years, we've been encouraged to change our thinking. Brad asked Ken what the latest theory was on dead heading. We believe, Brad, it's very important to leave as much foliage on the plant as is possible. After all, the foliage, as you know, is the food factory. And so, therefore, we just snap off the dead flower like that, cleanly, it comes away at the abscission layer. And that leaves all that lovely foliage to help promote new growth and new flowers. So you're just taking the flower stalk and the flower? Just the flower stalk and the flower and as little else as is possible. As you can see here, the flower's died. Its natural point of attachment is this abscission layer here. Now look carefully and you'll see there's a paler colour. This is already starting to die away. It's green beneath this joint and this pale yellow above. The flower will die back to that point. And when you're deadheading, all you need to do is just break that off and see how easily it comes away. If you look underneath, you can see there's a brown ring in there where it's already started to die. Most roses are grown on a rootstock or briar. Occasionally, this rootstock will produce a shoot which is called a sucker. They're easily distinguished from the variety. As you can see, there's this pale green growth, and quite often they will have seven or more leaflets. Whereas the variety that you're growing will usually have a reddish stem, not always, but usually, and certainly it will have fewer leaflets. In this case, it's only three. The rootstock is usually much more vigorous than the variety. And of course, the problem there is that if those suckers are left, they will actually take over and the variety that you're growing will die out. The best way to eliminate suckers is to get them off at source. That means scrape away the soil. It's always best to wear a glove for this, otherwise you can get pretty badly scratched. So scrape away the soil. If you can get a good firm grip on the sucker, and then one mighty wrench and try pulling it straight out. There you are, you can see where it's been torn away. And then if there are any bits left over, go in there with a pair of secateurs and cut those bits out. Established roses should survive drought conditions so they'll become stressed and prone to mildew but make sure new roses planted in the summer don't go short of water for the first few weeks. A thick layer of mulch around the base of the plant is a good investment and will help retain any moisture in the soil. And finally, don't forget to tie up the new growth to prevent it being damaged by wind and rain. You know, roses are perfect plants for going in containers. The main thing is that they're given plenty of room. So what you have to do is take into account the vigour and habit of the plant that you want to grow. As you can see here, we've got Iceberg, which is a fairly vigorous variety. And it's in a fair sized container. As you can see, there's plenty of room there for this particular plant to grow. Here, we've got a ground cover rose. And in fact, there's two or three in here. Much smaller pot, lower, more spready, conforms well with the habit of the plants that are growing. What we've got here is a patio rose that we're going to grow in a container. I've partly prepared it. What I like to do is actually use the pot as a template. Put in some of the compost, then stand the pot in, the growing pot, fill in around it, and then when you get up to close to the right level, you can actually take out the plant in its growing pot, take it out of the pot, And there you've got a perfect hole for it to fit. The reason I like to do it like this is that when the plants are actively growing, I don't believe it does them any good at all to actually start teasing out the roots and disturbing them. So fit it into the hole that you've made, firm it into position to make sure there are no air pockets, and then pull in the compost around it. Firm it well. There are two things to check here. Firstly, make sure that you can see that the bud union is above compost level and make sure that you've got at least an inch of clear container so that when you water the plant you can actually fill the container to the top there's plenty of water there to soak through 
and water the plant. What I like to do is use a loam based compost, in this particular case it's John Innes. For a start it holds quite a bit of moisture and also it's fairly heavy and it stops the container blowing about if you get a spell of wind. Some people worry about how to drain the pots. It's not really a problem. You don't need to worry too much about having crocs. The only thing that's likely to be a problem is if you're getting compost running through the hole in the bottom of the container. And the thing to do there is you just put in a sheet of newspaper folded and then add the compost afterwards. By the time the paper's rotted the compost will have settled and you shouldn't get any draining out through the bottom of the hole. Roses can be pruned at any time from autumn through to the late spring, so long as they're dormant. When you're pruning, it's important to have some sort of a plan. Start by removing any wood that's dead or damaged or any obvious signs of disease. Once you've done that, you can start to look for branches which are obviously competing or crossing over. Leave the strongest and remove the weakest so that you increase the overall strength of the plant. Here we've got something where there's lots of twiggy growths and really the best way to rejuvenate that is to go down fairly low and encourage strong growths to come again from the base. And the same on this one but not quite so low. A shoot such as this one which is obviously younger and much more vigorous, take it down but not quite so far. Where you can, go to a slightly outward facing bud so that you don't get the growth coming back across the centre of the bush. The best thing to do is to try and get the bush open so that you get a good airflow through the centre and this helps to reduce the risk of pest and disease. You only really get problems with diseases in particular when you get still static air. Any dead or older growths in the centre take out as low down as you can get and there's a good chance that you'll get new strong shoots coming from the base here just below where you've made the cuts. This one take well down, get as close to the knuckle as you can and that reduces the chance of dying back. This is the sort of thing that you'll often get with badly pruned sticks. You can take that out completely, it's damaged at the bottom, remove some of this older growth here. Take this down low and in fact with this one you can take off even more. You can see how it's dying back in there. There's a chance there that that could actually help spread disease. Take it well down. Remove the dead section from here. That'll harbour disease as well. And then these younger shoots take back again to an outward facing bud and finally with this take off the older growth cut this down to two or three buds and we should have much better roses next year So when you're pruning, Ken, what do you look for? What do you hope to achieve? More hot air has talked about pruning roses, uh, Brad, than almost any other thing in horticulture. Pruning roses is really simple. Two things, you try to keep the rose within bounds and make it produce lots and lots of lovely flowers. But what about an old one like this? I mean, what's this, about 25 years old? You can see from the size of this stump that it's certainly all of that age. And the amazing thing about that, despite the gnarled, uh, covered uh, appearance of it, in fact, there are lots and lots and lots of dormant buds in there. And what we've got to do is to regenerate it. We've got to make it produce lovely new shoots so it will go on for another 25 years. So what do we do? Where do we start? Well, you look at it and examine those and discover those which are the oldest shoots. And quite plainly, this shoot and this shoot have both got to come out. And I suggest we start by, if you'd very kindly cut off that there. stem there. Okay. Right, and take this one out somewhere there. There you go. And while you're at it, let's have that one out too, just above. 
Now those came out very easily with a good pair of loppers. To tidy the bush up you need a nice little saw just like this and what I'm going to do is to saw off as close to the stump as I can the, those two stems and right, there I'll, I go. I'll clear this top growth then. The thing with this is to make sure that you do cut the right branches that you've already separated. We need now to remove the old pieces. I'll draw that this right. way if you clear it. OK. Let's put substantial pieces out. There's this windy little piece in front sticking out of the front of the branch. I think we can do without that. Let's have that out. All right, I'll take it from here, shall I? Just one more there, if you can get it for me. Thanks. Just have to remove this last one here. What about this, Ken? There's some hips on it, thin and spindly. I think I would be inclined to take that away too. Okay, could you just do the honours there? Thank you. Now that leaves us one last small piece here to go. Let's clear him out of the way. Ticklish. OK, off with him. Anyway. Caught in some wire, I've got it. What we're now left with are five lovely fresh green shoots and the object now will be to loosen them and to train them left and right in the horizontal form that we've discussed already along these uh, stout wires. And what we have also done, which we can't show, is that we have provoked lovely new shoots which will emerge from that unpromising looking old stump. You would never believe it, would you? But no, it looks completely dead. <laughs> <laughs> One of nature's great uh, puzzles and quite amazing, but that will produce lots and lots of lovely new shoots and this plant will then go on for another 25 years. Is this the original bud union then? It will have been there, yes. Yeah. Right, so we start training, do we? We'll loosen it. So you, do you normally cut all the growths free so that you splay them out again? Yes. I personally find it's much easier to loosen the, the plant completely from the support. Mind your face. Okay. And we will now, we'll now train that one uh, horizontal along this the... This is coming my way. I think that will go nicely down to there. And if you like to trim off all the side shoots on that, Brad, we, what we're doing is we're going to provoke lovely flowering shoots to emerge from all of these dormant buds which you can see all the way along that lovely stout green stem. You want these taken back to spurs? Yes, down to a couple of, couple of inches. This one likewise. Brad, I think yours could go along the bottom wire. Right. And I think we could tie this one along the next wire. So those two are coming my way? They're coming your way. And the other remaining stems, we're also going to tidy up. Remove all the side shoots back to a nice spur. And having done that, train the, the growths along the most conveniently placed uh, wire guide. The so great you... thing to do this now is if it's done in the autumn, these growths are green and whippy and can be bent and tied in where you want them to go. Do you tie straight away or do you tend to plan them out and see where they'll go first? I think that's a good plan. Clean them up, work out, stand back, see where they're going to go first, then get in there and tie them up. And I think you'll see we've got the framework of a lovely new rose. New shoots will come and eventually the wall will be filled and the plant will go on for years. And the next job's tying, really? That's it. Do you treat ramblers any differently? There's a widely held perception, Brad, that ramblers are in some sense quite different to ordinary climbers. Well, the truth of it is they're not. There are some ramblers, wonderful plants like rambling rector, which can scramble through a tree and need no attention really whatsoever. But the vast majority of, uh, of ramblers are once flowering climbers and they should be pruned and treated just like ordinary climbers. There are just a few of them which will produce lots and lots of lax new shoots from the very base and if there are lots and lots of new shoots at the base, just as we have been demonstrating, so some of the old ones can be cut out. That's all the difference. So treat them all the same basically? Treat them the same. Right. This is the Royal National Rose Society's Queen Mother Rose Garden. 
as you can see, it's a, full of borders of uh, the old garden roses, which make these large plants. Sadly, it's autumn, and of course, they're not in flower at this time. So we're in amongst these shrub roses. What exactly is a shrub rose, Ken? People think they're some different class or breed or type of rose. In fact, they're not. They're just a large bush, uh, as you can see, all around us. And when it comes to looking after them, there are two schools of thought. You can either treat them just like an ordinary bush rose, uh -huh. such as we've already shown, or alternatively, you can let them grow nicely and freely and once every three, four or five years, give them a really good clear out. And I think we might try a bit of that, don't you? Here's a good one just over here, I think. OK. Here we have an old garden rose shrub, uh, Brad. You can see it's six or seven feet high and we're going to give it its three or four yearly clear out. And what we're going to do is to take out First of all, all the rubbish. This is quite plainly an old worn out shoot. You can see it's gone yellow with age. Out it comes. We're going to take out all the dead bits. Out with them. When we've cleared all the rubbish out, and here's more of the old dead stuff, when we've cleared it all out, then we're going to cut out some of the larger, older shoots, just leaving space for some of the lovely new shoots to come in. And having done that, we'll just tip over the top of those lovely new shoots, leaving a bush rejuvenated, ready to flower well. Out with that bit. What about down in there, Ken? That looks like a sucker to me. These roses, of course, are not far distant from the old species and wild roses, and you have to be jolly careful on them. That's not a sucker. It can be quite clearly seen that it is arising from above the budding rootstock, the, the bud uh, point, and it's actually a part of the rose. Yeah, you can see it from here. Yeah. So far we've just cleared a space and already we can see there's this very old thick stem in the middle here. I think we want to get rid of that. If I hold it clear, Brad, perhaps you can have him okay. out. Out with him. That's cleared the way for me to take out another dead bit. More yellow pieces, more dead bits. Sometimes you have to poke in a little bit and it's very helpful to have a another pair of hands. <laughs> See, all this old muck's grown up in the centre of the plant and we want to be shot of it all. Well, let's take a look. Another dead, miserable looking piece here, out with that. I think another piece here, out with that. I like to clear all the, all the dead muck out of the plant that's not going to be profitable, that's not going to do us any good. That's a big piece to be out of the way. So as a guideline, what do you take away, about a third? I would, uh, yes, not more than a, a generous third, I think. Now, you've got in your hands here yet another <laughs> mucky, twiggy old piece. I think we can do without that. All right, I've out got with that. Him. Another old shoot here, I think we'll take him right out. You go down that far? Yes, right out for that, to clear out some of these old ones. You can see we're beginning to leave a nice framework of lovely, fresh, green shoots. Here's another one, out with him. Just perhaps a... Got him? Right. One or two more dead bits. We will, of course, when we've finally finished, clear out some of the mess from the bottom, but we can do that easier later on. Let a bit of light in first. That's right. I what think this one's a thick old one here. Do you want that in so or out? I think uh, we might have him out. Perhaps if I hold the stems, you'll take him away. It's right a heavy duty one, is it? Bit more. One more go. Right, finish him off with right. a second dose. Out with him. Right, I've got him. And last but not least, one more piece here. If I think that's a second job again. Brad, if you can, if you can get in there. It's this one we're looking, is it? Yes, take him right out. Oh. Okay. I think that's now got us to the stage where we should now stand back and take stock. Take a view of the top and finish it off by cutting back all these lovely fresh green shoots, which are going to produce lots of flowers, by about a quarter, something like, like that. Let's. I'll do these. Mm -hmm. Yes, there, I think. Do you bother about restricting the height or not? 
I believe they just want to be cut to a nice height because these, these long thinny shoots, that you don't have to be uh, too bothered about thick shoots. Some of the thinny shoots on the old garden razors will produce perfectly satisfactory blooms. We've got a bit of a mess here. I think we'll take that one back a bit harder. And maybe that one too. And last but not least, this one in the middle here also. And I think there we fetch up with a, with a shrub thinned out, cleaned out, air can get round it, lots of lovely blooms for next year. One last tip there, and there we are. Well, I didn't think we'd have got that amount of growth out of that, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Quite amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Traveled the world more than any other flower. The Greeks and Chinese knew them, the Romans took them across Europe, the Crusaders brought them home from the Middle East. When people traveled, they took their roses with them. Their early history is shrouded in the mists of time. No one knows for certain the true ancestry of the ancient groups. Mottisfant Abbey Gardens in Hampshire has one of the finest collections of historic and ancient roses. It was once the walled kitchen garden. Species, or wild roses, are found growing naturally all around the northern hemisphere. Pollen carried by the wind, bees and other insects produce many natural hybrids. The oldest known cultivated rose in the west is the Gallica. This humble little plant is the ancestor of all the old European roses. The sport of Rosa Gallica is Rosa officinalis, also called the Apothecary's Rose. In medieval times, it created a major industry in the town of Provence near Paris, where the petals were used for herbal remedies and conserves. It's still being made today. Because the scent increased as the petals dried, they were also used as the equivalent of what we call air fresheners. We still use them today in potpourris. Mmm, marvellous. People believed that air sweetened with flower scents would prevent sickness, so there was an intense demand during times of plague. Remember this. Ring a ring of roses, a pocket full of posies, a tissue, a tissue, we all fall down. A traditional nursery rhyme, you might think, but all is not quite as it seems. The ring of roses are a reference to the sores that appeared on the skin and were the first sign of the dreadful plague. People carried poses of roses to ward off the illness, but after the tissue or tissue sneezing fits, it was already too late, and then they fell down and died. No wonder there was such a demand for the flowers in those awful times. The rose is also a symbol of the English nation. In 1236, the Queen of England chose a gold rose as her badge. When her younger son became the Earl of Lancaster, he chose the already famous officinalis. The English started calling it the Red Rose of Lancaster. The rose and crown have been linked together ever since. The sport of this rose is Rosa Mundi. It's not known whether the damask rose is so-called because it came from Damascus, or whether it was named after the woven pattern fabric known as damask. Just look at this modern sample, and you can see the flowers patterned on the material. The damask rose has long been cultivated for the very fragrant oil which is distilled from its flowers. They are still grown in the famous Valley of the Roses on the southern slopes of the Balkans. This is a traditional wooden flask from Bulgaria in which the precious rose oil is sent to famous perfumery houses all over the world. A later damask form was brought into Europe from the Middle East. People loved it because unlike all the other roses of those days, it flowered late in the year. It's possible that this is the rose the Romans knew. 
Emperor Nero had the flowers specially grown in the warm climate of Egypt to decorate his winter feasts. A hundred years after the English War of the Roses, a damask sport appeared, which has always been known as the York and Lancaster. Although the war officially ended in 1475, just go to a cricket match today in Leeds between Yorkshire and Lancashire, and you soon realise the war's still going on. We really know nothing about where Alba roses came from, except they were growing in classical times. This rose became known as the White Rose of York. No one's certain about the origins of the Centifolia rose either. It's seen in Dutch paintings before 1600, when growers in Holland introduced them to the rest of Europe. They're also known as the Cabbage Rose. It's easy to see how the moss rose got its name. The mossy bits are sticky to touch, but very fragrant. Around 1800, the cultivated roses from China arrived in Europe. This was a very important step in the development of the modern repeat flowering rose, though it would be a hundred years before that true potential of repeat flowering was realised. Before the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869, ships sailing from the east to Europe would stop off at the French Isle of Bourbon, now Reunion in the Indian Ocean. Here it is between Mauritius and Madagascar. The China Rose and Autumn Damask had been growing together in a hedge on the island and it was pure chance that the French botanist Monsieur Bréon noticed this first natural hybrid. Seeds from this rose were used to produce the Bourbon Roses which were painted by the French artist Redoute. It was at this time that Empress Josephine began her dream to create the greatest rose garden in the world at the Chateau de Malmaison outside Paris. She even managed to get a consignment of roses from a nursery in England through the French blockade when both countries were locked in war. The Victorians' favourite roses were the hybrid perpetuals, but by modern standards they were not perpetual. Hundreds of varieties were raised, of which only a few remain today. 1867 is a long time ago, but it's the beginning of the modern hybrid tea so named either because one of their parents, the China Rose, travelled west on the tea clippers, or because their scent was like a newly opened chest of tea. Have a sniff when you first open your next pack of China tea. The first hybrid tea is said to have been La France, raised by the French grower Guillaume. In 1910, the Danish breeder Poulsen introduced the hybrid Polyantha Rose. Not many remain today, and they're thought to be the forerunner of the modern Floribunda. It takes at least eight years, great skill, dedication and patience to produce a new rose. Rose breeders across the world are always looking for new and exciting varieties. great joys of gardening today is that you can wander around the garden centre in the height of the summer and choose a rose bush in full flower, which you can then take home and plant straight away. But here's a rose you won't be able to buy, not yet anyway, it hasn't even got a name. The reason is it's still in the society's trial ground. Brad went to find out more. 
It's a lovely society, Brad. It's for all people who love roses. We run shows, we publish books, we maintain these lovely gardens where you've been today, and perhaps most of important of all, in the gardens, we operate this, the Royal National Rose Society International Rose Trials. On the left are the roses in their first year of trial. They just come and they are allowed to establish. And incidentally, they come from just about every rose-loving country in the world, even China, Japan, India, every country in Europe, really? and so on. We're walking through the roses in their second year, and these in their second and their third year are judged every week during the flowering season by a team of, this year, 16 mixed professional and amateur rosarians, if I may coin such a word, and they're all very experienced, uh, rosy people. And the sort of things they're looking for are resistance to disease, novelty of the flowers, do they have lovely foliage, are they very floriferous? Now here's one we're coming up to just now, which I think would certainly qualify as being very floriferous. Do you look for scent as well? Yes. The society thinks that scent is really important. And in fact, so important do we think that, that we make special awards for the roses in the trials which have the best scent. I, I share the view that most people do, that a rose without any scent is really only half a rose. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Here's a jolly good example of a new rose which might stand in for an award. I can detect the scent of it from here. White flowers are becoming more popular these days than they used to be. Really? As opposed to this one, now you can see this is a really poor growing specimen. This too is a shrub. You see we only have two plants of each shrub rose, whereas mm -hmm. we have four plants of all the bush varieties. And this one has been here for three years, and what a poor effort that is. Definitely for the bonfire. So what about the awards, Ken? I mean, what, what's the premier rose award that you can actually award to a new rose? We gave our first gold medal, because that's almost the best, uh, Brad, in 1883. But in those days, they used to give awards to roses just plucked in a show in London. Uh, they never paid any attention to the quality of the plant that the rose was growing on, and whether or not it had disease or anything else, which, of course, we now think is quite <laughs> absurd. So the Society gives a few gold medals, but only if there are any good enough. If there are, the best one gets the President's International Trophy, and we also give trial ground certificates and certificates of merit, and any rose that gets one of those awards is by and large a good value garden plant. And what about the, the amateurs? I mean, is there a separate classification for them? No, they all enter the same pool, amateurs and professionals alike, and such is nature's bounty that quite often the professionals uh, and the amateurs have equal billing, and we've had a lot of very good amateur quality, high quality amateur roses that have won gold medals in the trials. When do they get named? Mostly after they have been given an award, because the award is an important part of making the track record of a rose. And talking of track records, just look at this one. Very floriferous shrub, reminds me very much of that climber American pillar. Yeah, it's a little bit darker, but do they have to wait three years to get an award? I mean, can they be so good to get an award at the end of the second year? Yes, they year? can. The very tip-top roses are given an award at the end of the second year. Only a few, perhaps two or three, sometimes none, but usually two or three. And they're the ones that are marked out for stardom. Right. Now, what, what about actually naming them? I mean, can, can anybody enter a rose here and give it a name, whether it goes through the trials or not? Yes, we invite more or less all comers to send roses for the trials here. And usually we have a good selection from both amateurs and professionals from all over the world. Generally speaking, the bulk of them, of course, come from the professionals. Mm -hmm. And it is in their last year when uh, the professionals think that they have got a winner on their hands that they will go out looking for a new name for their lovely new rose. And they're either named for a person, a prominent personality, royalty is quite common. Sometimes they're just given a lovely mellifluous selling name like Peace or Superstar. And sometimes they're actually sold uh, to a person who wishes to name a rose for a particular person. And how about this? This is the Society's very own credit card, and on there is the Paul Sherville Rose, which was named for this gentleman as a retiring gift from his uh, work colleagues. All right, do I get one of those before I can go? <laughs> oh, perhaps.
If you want to have a go at creating a new variety and perhaps making yourself a fortune at the same time, this is how to go about it. New varieties are produced by a carefully planned and controlled program of crossing two different roses. It's called hybridising and this is how you can do it. I've chosen Mullard Jubilee to be the female flower for this demonstration. Prepare the flower by carefully removing the petals. This flower is ideal to use because it's not fully open, which means no bees or insects have been able to get into the centre and transfer some pollen. The centre is the female part and it's called the stigma. The pollen grains will land on the stigma, travel down and fertilise the seeds in the base of the flower. The male part, the anther, is here. Because the flower is not ready yet, there's no pollen. And this is ideal, because now you need to remove these anthers to prevent any chance of self-pollination. Now you've got only the female stigma left, and this should be covered with paper or a muslin bag while you prepare the male flower. I've chosen a cultivar called Simba to be the male flower, and it's more open because it needs to have developed some pollen. Gently rub your finger on the anthers, if you pick up grains of pollen, the flower is ready. Remove the petals gently. You don't want to knock off the pollen. Now gently brush the pollen from the anthers to the stigma. Then place the bag over the flower and tie it up again. You don't really want marauding insects getting in there with a different sort of pollen which could ruin your hybridising programme. After five days, once fertilisation has taken place, you can take the bag off and leave the hip to ripen. In the autumn it's time to collect the hips. Pick them off the plant, split them open, and start to get out the seeds. Scrape the seeds out. These are going to be mixed with wet sand, stored outside in a container, exposed to the elements for 18 months, and then the seed will be sown in the usual way. And hopefully you'll start to get some new plants, your own varieties. If you've got a rose that you particularly like and you want to increase the numbers, there are several ways you can go about it. You can take softwood cuttings in the summer, hardwood cuttings in the winter, or you can propagate it by layering. The beauty of that is there's no risk involved because you only separate it from the plant once it's actually rooted. Start by digging a hole in the soil about four or five inches deep. Then carefully bend down a strong, vigorous shoot so that a section of the stem lies in the hole that you've just prepared. Trim away any leaves which will be in contact with the soil. This prevents them rotting. Pin the stem into position with a wire hook. The hole can now be refilled, burying this section of the stem. Finish off by firming the ground, and within a year, roots will form and the new plant can be cut away from its parent plant and transplanted. In the summer, you can propagate roses from softwood cuttings. This is the soft, sappy growth that's formed in the summer. You want lengths of approximately four inches. Make sure that the cut that you make is just below a node or joint. Carefully remove the lower leaves. Then dip the cutting in rooting powder, knock off any surplus and insert into the pot. Tap it gently to firm it. Then you want to cover the cutting and the pot with a polythene bag. This will prevent the growth drying out. You only need to water about once a week. Make sure you don't overwater. The big problem with that is that the cutting will rot at the base and then you'll lose it all together. Now to give you some idea, this cutting is two and a half, three months old. This is the sort of growth that you would expect, as you can see. It's a fair bit of top growth there. It's actually tried flowering. And then 
you can see the new root system that's developed. That plant's perfectly hardy and it'd be okay for planting out this winter. Speaking of winter, you can also propagate roses through the winter. In this case, you're using hardwood cuttings. What you're looking at, sections of hard, whippy growth that have taken a year to form. Cut at the bottom, just below a bud. You can see it there. They want to be about nine inches long. Don't bother measuring, I just use secateurs as a guide. Cut to the top bud, and this wants to be a slightly slanting cut, so that you've got this growth with a bud there at the top, and that will start the new growth. Now that's okay, I've picked one there that's not very thorny. What happens if you've got something that you want to propagate that is a little bit on the thorny side? The thing to remember is that roses are scrambling plants, so the thorns tend to curve down the stem, away from the top. So if you handle it from the top downwards, there's far less chance of you getting prickled. If you start to work from the bottom upwards, you'll soon find that you'll be taking thorns out of your fingers before very long. Now with the hardwood cuttings, I've got one here that's about 10 months old. As you can see from that, plenty of fibre at the base. You can see where all the roots have emerged. They take about a year to get to that size, thereabouts and then they can be lifted in the winter and transplanted to wherever you want to put them. You don't need any special facilities for hardwood cuttings. They can be inserted in the soil right next to the parent rows. A useful little dodge. Rather than dig a trench to put the cuttings in, get your garden fork, push it in about two thirds of the length of the tines. You've made four holes for the cuttings. Push them in, nice and firm, down to the bottom of the holes, and then press them in with your heel, tidy up the border, new plants before long. What do you make of this? Believe it or not, it is a rose, though you'll not find it in many gardens, you can see it growing at Mottisfont. Its common name is the Green Rose, dated about 1855. And here's another puzzle. What has this garlic bulb got to do with the roses? Well, try planting a clove of garlic at the root of each rose bush. And no, your roses won't come up smelling of garlic, but it'll go into the sap and keep the aphids away unless they're friend aphids. Brad and I found a glorious corner in the garden last summer to sit down and answer some of your questions about pests and diseases. Yeah, that's it. And that looks even older than you are. Yeah, I used to use one of these when I was a trainee. Really? Well, yeah. it's just general spray? Oh, yes, yeah, I used ah. to spray 10,000 roses with these. Well, I've got something even older over here. Oh, right. Older than this, you reckon? I reckon so. All right. Yeah. Oh, these are real antiques, Harry. Oh, here you are, then. How's that for a bit of Victorian craftsmanship? Oh, well, I thought mine was an antique, but, I mean, look at this, and it still works, does it? Well, I've got to cut a new washer for it, but apart from that, it'll be, be a goer. All oh, right. And what about the other one, then? Ah, uh, well, I bought that new about 20 years ago, so it's hardly an antique, but it's made in the same way. You know? The trouble is, they're all difficult to fill. Yeah, they're a bit heavy as well. Oh, you can see yes, why people yeah. go for plastic. Yes, I mean, these you know, modern ones, you can put this stuff in so much more easily. 
The roses are pretty trouble-free, aren't they? But you've got a fine collection of problems there. Yeah, um, we've, got, we've got some that are common and some not so common. Ah, the dreaded black spot, I think everyone knows that. Well, yeah, I think everybody's got a touch of black spot and it's, it's really common this year. Now, the, the beauty of, of controlling it is that you've got to spray the soil as well as the plant itself because ah. quite often the spores overwinter on the soil. Yeah, so uh, it's a case of collecting them up and destroying them if possible. Or at, at least spraying them. And the, yeah. the, the big problem tends to be that if it gets a really bad attack, the rose bush will be defoliated. Ah. You can often see them where all you've got is the flowers left and a couple of leaves, nothing else. Only have a fine specimen of mildew there, too. Yeah, that's right. I'm not so sure it's something to brag about, but I mean, <laughs> look at that. It's, uh, I mean, it's just like it's been dusted over with uh, flour, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, I mean, probably the most common disease on roses. Yes. And it tends to attack only the young shoots, but it, as you can see, it's causing quite a bit of distortion of the growth there, even the buds starting to turn over. Mm. And that needs spraying pretty quickly, otherwise it can really damage the new growth. Yeah, it needs tackling fairly soon, then. Mm -hmm. mm. And, of course, there's rust, isn't there? That yeah. seems to be traipsing through the country, spreading. Yeah, what's interesting about rust is until about 25 years ago, we, it was actually quite a rare disease of roses. Yeah. Of course, as we've gone for more central heating and less open fires, as the air's got cleaner, ah. the rust spread through the country. Psst. I mean, look at it. You can see how it gets the name. I mean, look at yeah. it. It really looks as if it is going rusty. So it's black spot, mildew and rust. There are things now which treat all three, aren't there? Yeah, I must admit, that's the sort of thing I prefer to do. If you can use one chemical and spray all three. What about pests? Well, take your pick. I suppose the one that everybody can identify readily with is the aphids. Oh, yes. <laughs> and again, a bit like the mildew in terms of it tends to go for the young, soft tissue that it can actually mm. penetrate with its feeding mouth parts. Uh, and spread infection. Yeah, the big problem is that, um, as well as weakening the plant because of their excessive feeding, they can actually transmit virus. Ah. And these are the first symptoms that you tend to see. The big problem with virus is that there's no real cure and uh, the disease is actually living within the plant. The plant will get weaker and weaker and it's really dig up and burn, I'm yeah. afraid. Mm. You've got a plant here infested with a lot of these. Mm. Brown ones, white ones, and the sticky substance. Yeah, um, well, for a start, the white ones, they're actually the skeletons of the dead insects. The, the browny coloured ones, um, the colour tends to be dictated by what they feed on. And the rose sap has obviously got some colour in it, so you tend to get these reddish brown aphids uh, out of it. The sticky substance looks almost like a sugar coating mm. along the leaves. That's honeydew, and it's actually secreted from the aphids as they feed. And the problem with that is that it actually att attracts ants. Yeah, yes. And don't they uh, form sooty mould afterwards? Yeah, you can, you can get either surface dust or you can get a fungus growing. That it doesn't harm the plant, apart from it stops the leaves working properly. But the mould actually lives on the sugary substance rather than on the leaf. Yeah, so I get on my aubergines and things like that in the greenhouse. Yeah, and it can be a real problem. But the biggest problem is you, if you've got the ants as well as the aphids, You've got the ants burrowing around the roots, so you're getting stress on the plant ah, there. Yes. And then you've got the aphids feeding on the top, and you've got stress on the top of the plant. And of course, there are pests that eat the leaves, aren't there? Yeah, um, you can get caterpillars. You can also get these leaf chafers. And what's interesting about those is that they can only actually um, feed on the soft tissue, ah, the leaf blade itself. Yeah. And that's why you often get these skeletonized leaves. The veins are too thick and too tough for their mouth parts, so they get left, and it looks like um, a summer version of an autumn leaf where you've got the skeleton effect. Yeah. Like the old leaf miner, but I'm going right through. <laughs> yeah, well, the leaf miner tends to go through between yeah. the two layers yes, of the leaf, it. whereas this, these are scraped away. Yeah. And of course, we get a lot of letters about pests on roses and diseases, too. One here, for instance, it says, what is dieback? Well, dieback is where you get a section of the, a shoot dieback. It can be old woody material or younger growth. I think what's important there is not the fact that there's dieback, it's to find out what's caused it. Yes, yes. Um, plants are very good at marshalling their resources and quite often if there's a section of a stem that's not really contributing, the plant can almost reject that and then it will die back to the next living joint. Ah, yeah. The big problem with dieback is not so much it's there and it's unsightly. You can often get um, spores of rust, black spot and mildew can overwinter in the dieback. Ah. 
Things like coral spot, they can invade the dieback and then they yeah. start to go into the live tissue and yeah. you've got real problems oh, yes. then. Now somebody's written here, I've heard that soil sickness could be one of the reasons why newly planted roses fail to grow in a bed from which older roses have been dug up. What is soil sickness? Well, it's not actually the soil. The scientists have found that what happens with plants like roses, and lots of other plants as well, but with roses, they actually form an association with fungi that live in the soil. Ah. And of course, when you get a large mature plant, it can support a large population of fungi, and the two live in balance together. Yeah. But if you take out that old rose, a large old rose, and put in a small new one, ah. yeah. you've still got the high population of the fungi, and of course, the small plant can't possibly support it and they literally go under, they die back, the growth is weak, very poor, and they're actually being drained away by the, the fungal spores that are in the soil. Although that's really why we recommend to change the soil. You either change the soil and have a large planting pit, or now people are actually looking at the possibility of injecting steam or trying to use chemicals to sterilise the soil. And here's another one. Why do some buds develop normally but then turn brown and fail to open? Well, that's often referred to as balling. Ah. And the greater the number of petals you have in a, in a bloom, the more chance of balling. It's ah. usually a result of wet weather. It can be either heavy dews or it can be heavy rain. And what tends to happen, the outer petals get saturated and then they stick together. Oh, yes. They'll I've turn brown. Mm. They form a casing and so the bloom can't open and eventually the whole lot just rots and dies yeah. and it can die down the stem. Ah. Now, why do some roses have green centres, we asked? Well, there's been a lot of that this year. And what's extraordinary about it is that you can have a perfectly formed oh, yes. bud like yeah. that. And then you've got something like this where it's all green in ah. the centre. Now, that's called proliferation. Proliferation. Yes. And you get distorted growth from the centre. So you've got normal petals. Then you've got these distorted petals, and in the centre you've actually got another bud growing out from the middle of the flower. Could the cold we've had have caused this? Well, it could, but I don't think the cold explains why two blooms of approximately the same age, one of them's perfectly formed, the other one's got this proliferation. It's obviously some sort of physiological disorder, and some people think it can also be caused by a virus. Really, the only thing you can do is actually prune off the distorted flowers yes. to encourage perfectly formed flowers to develop. So it's only the odd one or two on the... Well, yes, it seems to be, and some years it happens, other years not. Now, a lot of people say, my neighbours are always spraying their rose bushes, but they don't want to do this. And they say, which are the most trouble-free varieties? Is there such a thing? Well, everybody's got a preference for what colour they want, whether they want floribundus, hybrid teas, or whatever else. So what I tend to do as a general guideline, I look for plants that have got thick, tough, leathery, glossy foliage, oh, yes. Um, anything that's related to peace looks really sturdy. Yes. Um, Rosa rugosa, those thick, rugose, strong, heavily veined leaves, you know, they're, they're just about fireproof. Mm. Now, we've talked about pests and diseases. We haven't said about treating them. Well, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to the fact that you do have to do some spraying and it's very much a compromise. I always like to wait until I see the very first symptoms yes. before I spray, rather than just keep blanket ap applications of chemicals. And what I try to do is use one chemical as a cure-all for everything. I don't like loads and loads of bottles on the shelves. Uh -huh. Any special spraying techniques? Well, I think it depends what you're going after, really. Um, certainly with mildew and with aphids, they only tend to attack the young growth as it develops. So quite often, if they're the problem, you can get away with spraying probably the top third of the plant. Yeah. With rust, it's a bit different because the spores tend to develop on the underside of the leaf first. So if it's rust that's a problem, mm. you need to spray from underneath. Yes. There's all this talk about spraying, a fair bit of controversy at the present time. Aye. You can see from the age of this, you know, spraying is not a new technique. No. What will people have used in them? Well, quite often it was things based on uh, sulphur. I mean, some, some of the um, nicotine-based insecticides. Ah, yes. And, you know, we're getting safer and safer chemicals all the time. I mean, some of the things that they used in the past. Oh, frightening, yes. Well, health risk is nowhere in it. <laughs> no, that's one thing. The modern garden chemicals are so much safer, aren't they? Well, yes, and of course, as we're looking more at biological control, um, safer and safer chemicals, stricter testing, they're getting safer for people to use at home.
don't even have to wear goggles now, do you? They say no, you, you can if you want to, but you don't have to. I'm going to say you don't, but I always prefer to still have rubber oh, gloves on and yes, a bit yeah, of protection. That's it. Good things come to an end, and now we must leave you to get on with growing your own favourites. So, from Brad and me, it's goodbye until the next time. Bye. So, what are we going to do next, then, eh? Oh, rosy people cane grapes referred to earlier on, or more likely someone who just enjoys gardening, perhaps you should think about joining the Royal National Rose Society. Becoming a member entitles you to all sorts of privileges. There are the gardens, of course, to visit free of charge for yourself and a friend. Membership means you can get help and advice on many of your gardening problems from the staff who work here at this lovely old house in Storbans. If you're visiting, there's a comprehensive library of reference books and you can borrow slides for your lectures and talks. As a member, you're entitled to free or reduced rate entry to many of the country's top flower shows. You've already got more than value for your subscription and you'll also receive the quarterly magazine, The Rose, and these two useful books. Founded in 1876, the Society is a registered charity which carries out valuable research work. Your subscription is a vital contribution to the Society's funds. All the details are in the sleeve of this video. Membership is for all keen gardeners, beginners and experts, rosy or not. Another garden with many historic roses is Mottisfont Abbey Garden. Here you find one of the foremost national collections of old-fashioned roses in Britain. The Rose Garden and Abbey Grounds are open to the general public and details can be found on the inside of the sleeve. And finally, Periwinkle Productions have five more gardening videos. Keep a look out for them and add them to your collection. Well, it's almost goodbye again, except for one of those hiccups you sometimes get when filming. Except it wasn't a hiccup. Take six. Could the cold we've had cause this? Well, it could. I don't think anybody really knows what does cause it and what's particularly strange about it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Couldn't stop it. Ah. <laughs> Not to be sneezed at. Enjoy your gardening.